Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Cameron, Programs Manager at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to tonight's program, Don't Let It Get You Down, with Savala Nolan. This conversation will be moderated by Christy Harrison, host of the Food Psych Podcast. Tonight's program is part of our Good Lit series, generously supported by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We'd also like to give a special thanks to Marcus Bookstore in Oakland, California for partnering on tonight's program. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in the chat or comment section of the live stream that you're currently watching. The Commonwealth Club is going full speed ahead with a full slate of live and online programming this summer and fall. We ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work this year and beyond. Please visit us at commonwealthclub.org online to learn more, and you can also click the donate button you see on the right side of your screen during this program. Now. Please join me in welcoming Savala Nolan and Christy Harrison to Inforum. Thanks so much, Nicole, and hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club with Inforum. I'm Christy Harrison, host of the Food Psych podcast and author of Anti-Diet, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's program. I'm so excited to be in conversation tonight with Savala Nolan, who is a writer and executive director of the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at the University of California, Berkeley. Tonight, we'll be discussing her new book, Don't Let It Get You Down, Essays on Race, Gender, and the Body, which is now available at bookstores everywhere. In it, she shares the lessons she's learned in a relentless effort to live authentically between two separate worlds. Before we begin, just want to remind the audience that, as Nicole said, if you have a question for Savala, please ask it in the chat or comment section, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. And now, before we begin our conversation together, Savala is going to do a reading from her book. So, Savala, take it away. Thank you, Christy. I love being here with you. Full disclosure, I know Christy from outside of the Commonwealth space, and it feels so wonderful to have a friend in the room with me, so to speak. Um, and before I read, I also want to thank everyone at the Commonwealth Club and at Inforum, um, especially Nicole and Mark, who have been so wonderful with this very non-tech savvy writer in terms of getting me up to speed um, and welcoming me, welcoming me into this space in this community. So thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm going to read uh, for maybe three or four minutes uh, the very beginning of the very first essay in the book. And the essay is called On Dating White Guys While Me. And before I start reading, um, I just will unpack a couple things about the essay that, you know, if we were together in person, I probably would read a little bit more than three minutes and I wouldn't have to unpack all of this um, for you. But given the constraints of Zoom, um, I'll just do a little bit of level setting before I dive into the actual text. So this essay is about my former, um, but rather, you know, longstanding and um, really deep and enduring for most of my life desire to be chosen by a certain type of white man as a romantic partner and um, the quest that I embarked on, you know, from probably my 20s to my 30s, maybe my teenage years to my 30s. Um, to sort of land a certain type of white guy because I thought that being chosen by that type of person would effectively lift me out of the sort of pit of otherness that I found myself in. So this essay is about that journey and how I got over it. Um, Another thing I will unpack for you is that, of course, I talk a lot about my body in this essay and I talk about my body in the whole book. In particular, I talk about my feet in this essay. That's because for me, um, my feet have sort of always seemed like my tell of otherness. 
I'm 5'10". I have big feet. I always wanted cute little feet. And somehow my feet seem to encapsulate all the ways that I was not the cute little white girl that I wanted to be when I was a kid. And so I was very self-conscious about them and felt like I had to hide them um, and didn't want them to be seen by these guys that I was pursuing. I suppose it's kind of particular to have this about your feet. Um, but I think it's probably common, maybe even universal to have parts of ourselves and parts of our bodies that, you know, um, we hide or we're in the habit of concealing because revealing them to others feels too vulnerable or feels like it would, um, show some truth about ourselves that we don't, we don't want seen. So that's the background. And here's a few minutes of the essay. On dating white guys while me. Holt was a catch, and I thought maybe we were heading somewhere. But then I saw his feet, and they were beautiful, unlike mine. Dating requires intimacy, bare feet side by side, maybe touching at the foot of a bed in the sand, the grass. I did not want to place my feet next to his. His feet were smooth and well-shaped as if carved from marble with neat cuticles and nails filed symmetrically. When I saw them, I thought, they're like the David's right foot. Years before, I'd sketched David's feet in charcoal, full of hope, the filtered light as gentle as a powder puff in the Florentine Museum, a hushed flow of tourists and art students around me. I wish I'd sketched the slaves in their pocked granite confines instead. But back then, in the spring of 2002, it was David who spoke to me. He was being cleaned with water and Q-tips by erudite Italians kneeling on scaffolding beside his pensive brow. That's how Holt's feet seemed to me, like things another person would carefully clean for him. There were many things about Holt that I liked. I liked how his biceps emerged from t-shirt sleeves. I liked how he stood next to me at that Christmas party on Benvenue Ave, brushed up and emitting a gently possessive warmth that made me giddy. I liked getting breakfast with him early in the morning at the coffee shop that served so-so coffee. And I liked how it looked to anyone walking by, me with him. I liked how he lingered when I drove him home that brisk autumn night, leaning back into the car, suggesting we get together soon to study. We were in law school. His big nosed face, an impish smile illuminated by porch light. I liked that he was from New York, that he was smart, that his dad was an iffy presence in his life like mine that his sneakers were always clean, that he drank gobs of whiskey and beer and never seemed drunk, that his East Coast self-possession shone brightly against the floppy California exuberance in which we lived. And I liked that he was white. I liked his whiteness in an uncomfortable, subterranean way. I'd long sensed that the most succinct, irrefutable way to move up in the world was to be loved by a prototypical white man, i.e. someone at the top. There's a cultural magic in their approval, a kind of magnetizing glitter that surrounds the approved of object. So I pursued them. I had relationships with men of color, too, but a certain type of white guy had a particular hold on my psyche. I hoped in landing one to earn a medal, to sling it around my neck and prove that I wasn't too low on the ladder for blessings. Adjacent to them, accepted by them, I'd undo the injuries of not belonging I'd endured. I'd become the girl I'd ached and tried my whole childhood and adolescence to be, a version of that fairy-like Nordic blonde in a Timothée shampoo commercial over whom I obsessed as a child, floating on my back in the bath and imagining my brown cotton candy hair was a white silk ribbon like hers. Holt had potential. He could be my world of oysters, we clicked, 
He seemed to see that I was bright, credentialed, special. He, with his jocular, confident whiteness, could slay my otherness, rescue me from the ogre of myself. I'd grieve, yes, but then I'd watch my life bloom, unfettered by bigness, by brownness. I really believed this until I saw his feet, which were so handsome, sophisticated even, compared to mine. So that's a little bit of the book. And I just want to say by the end of that essay, I am in a very different emotional place, not in the same pursuit uh, at the beginning of the essay, but that's where the book starts. I love where it starts. I love that essay so much and like the journey you take us on in it. And thank you, Christy. Yeah. And I feel like each each essay we could have a whole hour long conversation about, you know, they're all so specific and and yet have these sort of universal resonances. And I think a lot of people, you know, people I've talked to about the book already have really identified with that essay in particular for various reasons, you know, just. Yeah, it seems to be striking a chord with a lot of people, even like white guys <laughs> told me that, you know, that essay speaks to them. So I don't know, a little a little fairy came and sprinkled magic dust on my keyboard while I was while I was typing that one, I think. Oh, it's so fantastic. I want to talk more about that and also kind of the process of opening up about that part of your life because it is so vulnerable. Um, but first, what kind of can start at the beginning and you know everyone saw that beautiful book cover of yours in the introduction which is i love the lettering it's just gorgeous and i'm curious to talk a little bit about the title you know how you came up with the title and what the sort of meaning of it is for for the collection Thank you for complimenting the cover. That's the work of Zoe Norval. She's a, a freelance uh, designer and, and it, it takes my breath away every time I look at it. Um, the, the title of the book um, is something that was told to me, something that was said to me uh, by my hairdresser, actually, who is an older black man that I've known for many years. Um, and I tell the story of it in in the book in an essay by the, by the same name. So here's what happened. It was about six years ago now. And I was in the salon, you know, just kind of having a pleasant day and chit chatting with him as one does. And I opened my phone, the news app and saw uh, that the cops who shot and killed Tamir Rice were not going to be prosecuted. That was the top headline at that moment. Um, and, you know, sadly, horrifyingly, it can be hard to differentiate <laughs> one victim of this kind of violence from another. So I will I will just say um, that Tamir Rice was a child who was playing in the park um, in the Midwest in the snow, a black boy. Someone called 911. Um, the cops came to the park and what was so salient to me anyway about what followed was that it was only two seconds from the time um, the cop cars approached the park to the time that the officers fired their weapons and killed this little boy. Just two seconds. Um, that really struck me. And so seeing that they were not going to be prosecuted, prosecuted, you know, it just brought all of that back. I was visibly upset. I was visibly shaken and my hairdresser noticed and he said, what's wrong? What's going on? And I explained they're not going to prosecute those cops. And he sort of stepped back and he took a breath and he said, don't let it get you down. Don't let it get you down. He said it twice and he said it very sternly. Um, it was not at all the kind of, oh, don't let it get you down. You know, there was none of kind of the lightness or even like the flip quality that sometimes we associate with that phrase. Um, he was very weary. His voice was very heavy and stern while he was speaking. And I realized in that moment, an older black person was offering a younger black person a survival strategy with, uh, you know, a survival strategy for a situation with very high stakes, right? Because if you're black um, and you could 
say the same thing about a lot of marginalized groups in our culture, but certainly if you're black and you let the status quo and the history get you down, um, it's so breathtakingly difficult that you may never get up, right? You may drown if you let it get you down. And that is mostly how I mean it in this book as, as a very serious survival strategy to my fellow black people and fellow women and fellow marginalized people. But there's also a way that I could have like put a question mark at the end and, you know, kind of been talking to people who hold a lot of privilege and power in our culture or um, the more privileged and powerful aspects of my own identity. Cause it's kind of like, you know, I don't know if you're in a really privileged position, um, maybe you should let it get you down. Like maybe you should dwell in the history and the madness of how we allocate safety and well-being and value in our culture and let it bring you to your knees. You know, um, part of the problem is that that doesn't happen, right? Privilege, Privilege means not having to pay attention to problems that don't directly impact you. So there's another way in which it's kind of like an invitation, right? Um, so it's a complex phrase and I mean it in a complex way as the title of the book. I love that. I love the sort of dual consciousness of it, you know, and the, the dual meaning and that sort of, um, brings me to this other essay that really struck me, which was you discovering that you had ancestors who who had enslaved people, right? And yeah. sort of the the weight of that, you know, I think I think that is something that a lot of people with, you know, people of white ancestry don't think about a lot, right? And um, you know, having ancestors who hold enslaved people on one side and those who are enslaved on the other is an experience that you have and, and many people of mixed race descent have, right? But I think people might think of that dichotomy sort of in the abstract, but mm -hmm. I'm curious like what it was like for you to viscerally understand it, to actually discover documents showing that you know, a distant ancestor of yours had a number of people listed as his, as his quote unquote property. Yeah, I mean, you are right. I happen to live at the intersection of enslavement um, experienced from all sides, you know, at least as far as this country goes, because on the black and Mex Mexican side of my family, which is my dad's side, um, the family tree is just sort of frayed and falls apart. Uh, before the Civil War in Louisiana and Alabama. And, you know, that's slavery. Um, so my ancestors on that side were enslaved. And the white side of my family um, did the enslaving, right? Not necessarily of those Black ancestors, but they were on the other side of that um, phenomenon in the culture. And, you know, for decades, I should say, right, this wasn't like a passing, um, a passing situation for them. So my sister actually found on a genealogy website, a deed in which my fourth great grandfather on my mom's side um, gave, as strange as that sounds, three people to his daughter. Um, and the people were named Phyllis, Grace and Peggy. And they were listed as Negroes. And the fact that he was giving them, you know, obviously means that that he held them in bondage. They were enslaved people. In a way, finding the deed um, and learning about the deed from my sister was shocking and horrifying, right? In another way, it wasn't really a big surprise, like many, many white families in this country have a direct economic tie to chattel slavery, um, either as slaveholders or people who, you know, in some other way benefited from it, whether they lived in the South or the North. Um, so we weren't terribly surprised to find it, but it was still a shock. And before I went through the trouble of having to like metabolize 
that reality, I wanted to authenticate it. And so the essay that you're asking about, Christy, is really about the process of authenticating it um, and what it felt like to metabolize the reality of that situation once that I, I was sure that the deed was really real and was describing, you know, what it looked like it was describing. And indeed, um, that side of my family for decades and decades and decades uh, were human traffickers and held men and women and children in bondage and sold them and bought them. And uh, this was history that I had never really learned about my family, despite the fact that the white side of my family, um, you know, has a fair amount of like interest in, and pride in family history, right? This detail never really made it into uh, the stories that we learned about that side of the family. What struck me, you know, through this process of doing the research and writing about it um, were really two things. One, how incredibly easy it actually was to get information about my slaveholding family, right? There's this very strange duality where Black people in this country who can trace their lineage back to slavery, um, they can't get any specific information, right? Because their forebears were treated like property. Like they, we can, we have a deep hunger to understand how we came to be in this country and what those early centuries or decades were like and how they come down through history to us today. But it's almost impossible to get that information. And then on the flip side, there are so many white families for whom the information is readily available, you know, with just a, a, a very little bit of research um, and there's no desire to engage with the information. So being kind of at that nexus, right, of those tensions um, was fascinating. I hadn't realized that it was really quite simple to learn what your family's connection to chattel slavery was. Um, we sort of act as though it's this very distant thing that's shrouded in mystery and impossible to, you know, specify what your involvement may have been. Um, and that's just not the case. Like enslaved people were, were, uh, marked on property records because they were considered property. So tax records have been part of this country's history since it was a colony and that's where you can find them, right? If you know the name of an ancestor, you can find their tax records in the county or state where they lived. Another thing that really struck me as I was writing this piece um, was questioning whether I could see Phyllis, Grace, and Peggy, you know, these three people for whom we have names, there were many, many more um, whose names I don't know, but whether I could see them without the white gaze standing in the way, you know, so much of the information that we all see from when we're little kids about chattel slavery is mediated through whiteness, right? It's mediated through the white gaze because history is told by the victors and so on and so forth. So it was rather um, devastating to wonder whether I could even, you know, as earnest and as heartfelt as my desire to see and pay homage to these women was, it was devastating to realize that it was probably impossible for me to see them um, in a way that wasn't mediated by, you know, the white lens through which American history has been written and portrayed. And I'm still struggling with that, to be honest. You know, I'm still wrestling with with that loss, I guess you could say. Yeah, I feel like that grief really comes through in the essay, too. It was one of many that moved me to tears in the book. And it, it, there was just something very powerful about your processing of that grief, you know? Thank you, Christy. I mean, it's, it's ongoing. I'm still doing research and, um, I don't know if you've seen the show finding your roots on PBS mm -hmm. with skip Gates. I love that show. Cause I'm kind of a genealogy buff, 
um, and a history buff, but I hired the, the company that they work with um, to continue doing research on my family because this genealogy and ancestry company called Lineages focuses on uh, black history going into enslavement. Mm-hmm. So still doing research and still trying to learn you know, anything and everything I can, especially about the people that we trafficked and held in bondage. I just feel um, that it's a debt I owe. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I think it's going to inspire a lot of people. It certainly inspired me to have a conversation with my family, actually, that I had never had, which because, you know, most of my family is immigrants and more recent than um then slavery was abolished, you know, so there's, I was like, there's no way, no, we, they wouldn't have, you know, they were poor, they were immigrants, they were, you know, Jewish and Irish and, and wouldn't have held slaves. But there was one side of the family, my mom mm. told me, you know, it was like, oh, wow, why did we never talk about this? That this is a, this is a thread nobody's ever pulled on, you know? Yes, it's incredibly complicated. And, you know, the funny thing about it being ancient history, you know, it is in a way. Um, And in another way, it's really not like in the 1930s, um, there were at least 100,000 people, I want to say, alive who had been born into slavery. They were old, you know, they were in their 80s and their 90s. Um, but they were alive. My godfather, who's still alive, um, is 86, maybe he's 87. Um, And when he was born, the last known person to be kidnapped in Africa, transported through the Middle Passage as part of the transatlantic slave trades black market at that point, sold into slavery, this person was still alive. So... Wow. There's a way that it's like old history in another way in which it's just it's just not right. You know, there's another way that it's it's right now. It's almost living memory, like living memory overlaps with that time. Right. That's so fascinating. It is. I'm curious because that that's, you know, your mom's side of the family. Right. And another essay that I think was particularly striking was the one about your relationship with your white mom and sort of how that helped shape your own relationship with your blackness Mm -hmm. and how race has also shaped that relationship and the the sort of dynamic of it unfolding over the years. Can you share a little bit about that experience and also maybe what it was like to write about that and sort of process and think through that? Yeah, I mean, it was complicated. (laughs) All of it was complicated, the experience and the writing about it in a nutshell. Um, But yes, I am a mixed black person and I grew up with mostly my white mother. She primarily raised me after my parents split up. I did spend time with my dad, but she was without question my primary caregiver and the culture of her family, you know, her parents and so on. Um, was really the defining culture in our house. And and it was white because they were white. I was incredibly lucky though, to have a mom um, who, she had the presence of mind and the insight to understand that she was going to have to purposefully provide me um, with some kind of education around blackness that I would have probably gotten organically had my dad been living in the home, right? Because he was black, but that I wasn't necessarily going to get organically um, because he wasn't my primary caregiver. She was, you know, that is a that is an insight that not every white person who is raising a, a, a child of color or a black child has. And, you know, especially not 40 years ago, right. When I was born. So I have to give my mom tremendous credit for going out of her way to connect me with black children and black adults and to surround me as much as she could with, you know, a black political consciousness, black style, black music, black food, you know, there's a way that you could read those efforts as contrived, but, um, that would be wrong. That's not the right way to read them. They were purposeful and they were powerful. And because I knew that I was black, you know, um, 
they felt right to me, right? Like it was obvious to me as a kid that I wasn't white and being presented with so much black culture um, felt right to me. It didn't feel contrived at all. On the other hand, you know, of course my mom couldn't do this perfectly. She had her own blinders and fragility and, you know, all of that stuff around race. And, um, there were things that she couldn't teach me or things that she herself hadn't fully cleaned up. Right. Like she used to have a sort of a narrative about my dad being illiterate. Um, and she would, you know, I write about this in the book. She would sometimes kind of offer up that biographical fact about him, you know, as a way of kind of demonstrating like how good her whiteness was that she was still able to like connect with him and see him as a whole person and all of that. Um, and he wasn't illiterate, <laughs> like the, the, it wasn't true. Right. But there was some sort of blinder of whiteness. He wasn't well-educated. He wasn't erudite. He wasn't um, steeped in like any canons of literature, but he could read and write, you know, at a basic level. And, um, but she couldn't see that, or she couldn't fully live in that space, I think, because of what her whiteness kind of asked her to do and how it made her see the world. So there were certainly ways, um, that it was difficult, you know, it's difficult to contend with your parents' racial blind spots without their help. You know, when you're a kid, you, you rely on your parents and I had to contend with her unmetabolized anti-black bias, um, without her help at times, you know, and, and that sucked. I will say, you know, my dad provided a kind of racial education that was invaluable, um, not really through any effort that on his part, but just simply through his being because his body looked like mine and my body didn't look like anybody on my mom's side of the family. I was bigger. I was blacker. You know, my hair didn't look like theirs, my nose, my mouth. I just felt like a, a stranger in a strange land physically with my mom's side of the family. Um, but not with my dad. He just, he explained my body to anyone who saw me um, in a way that didn't happen with my mom or with my mom's side of the family. It was sort of like, oh, I wonder what the connection is there. You know, what's the situation? But with my dad, it was so obvious. So without even trying, just through the presence of his physical body, he provided um, a racial home for me that was extremely powerful to and writing about this, you know, my dad has passed away, so he did not have a chance to read the book. My mom has read it. And, you know, we're at a place now where like, I can write this stuff as I see it and we can talk about it. And maybe we struggle a little bit at the margins, but fundamentally um, she's really open to it. And she is open to me speaking publicly about it. Um, and I'm incredibly thankful for that really, truly incredibly thankful for it because she didn't ask to be written about, you know, she could have reacted in a different way. Um, but I also think when you read the book, it comes through how important my mother is to me and how thankful I am for her. Yeah, I think it really does. I think it's, it's such a nuanced piece and like, yeah, I mean, writing about that when it's sort of in process and unfolding and such a, a difficult, messy thing had to be so challenging. And, and I'm curious, you know, talking about parents and moms in particular, right? You're a mom, mm -hmm. you have a, a daughter and I'm curious how you're raising her to relate to her blackness and Mexican heritage and other aspects of her identity in ways that maybe you wish you had had, or, you know, in, in ways that you, didn't even know she needed or you had needed. You know, it, 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 there are ways that it's joyful and ways that it's really not, you know, um, part of my job as her mother is to teach her about her body. And that includes her race. It also includes her gender. Um, and I resent that part of that means teaching her about 
what this culture does to black people and to women, you know, I, I resent and I, I'm angry about the fact that, you know, part of my job, if I'm going to adequately prepare her for the world, and if I'm going to, um, you know, instill in her a set of protective boundaries and an ability to gauge danger, right which I have to do. She's a girl and she's not white. I have to do it. Um, But if I'm going to do that, I also have to crush some of her innocence, right? When I teach her as I teach her, because of course it's ongoing that she is black. She's not white. Um, Over time, as that conversation becomes more sophisticated, right, as it has to and it will, there's damage that happens there, too. Like, it's not all damage. I mean, I wouldn't trade my blackness and I wouldn't trade my womanhood. You know, I wouldn't rather be a white man, man, not to knock white men, but like I just... I'm who I am and I love it. And that's beautiful. There's so much joy in blackness and in womanhood. Um, And that's part of what I get to teach her, but having to teach her that she is a target, you know, that she isn't safe fundamentally the way other people are, um, that there is some precarity to her status that other people don't have to wrestle with. I resent having to do that. And, um, I don't know that I'm doing a good job, frankly, you know, I have more respect for my mom because she went through the same things, right. Raising a little girl in a world that doesn't really treat women that well and raising a a black person in a world that vilifies blackness is really complicated. The other thing with, with my daughter is that, um, you know, she's young. I don't know what she's going to look like as an adult, but she's got kind of like that Mariah Carey look to her or like Halsey, like the look of a mixed black person who many white people will just <clears throat> read as white, right? She may or may not read as black people to, to the white people she encounters in the world. Nevertheless, um, the reality of our culture is that if you're any bit black, you're not white and you're not welcome in whiteness. And so I have to give her a home in blackness because um, that is the place where she can find one. And what she looks like to some extent complicates that as I think, you know, maybe it did for, for my mom when I was a little bit younger too. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It's being a parent has got to be so tough and you're it's just figuring tough. it out as you go along, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. Best thing in the world. Hardest thing in the world. There's just no way right. around it. Right. Well, switching gears a little bit and kind of, uh, moving into what I call the gushy part of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Who's gushing? Uh, you or me? <laughs> I'm gushing. You're taking the gush and, and dealing with it. <laughs> um, okay. No, you're an amazing writer. I am so moved by your writing and I admire your style so much. And I think in the passage that you read, people can probably hear a little bit of, what I mean when I say, you know, it's the book is very lyrical. It's sort of an experience unto itself to read. I think it's, um, you know, we're having a a conversation about it in prose that I think is really wonderful and illuminating. And it's nothing like the book, really, like the experience Mm -hmm. of reading the book is, is, you know, so much more, there's this sort of literary um, nonfiction aspect to it that I think is, it's really wonderful to read. And thank I'm just, you. Thank you, Christy. I did that <laughs> very welcome. high praise. Thank you. I, I seriously wish that I had anywhere near your skill as a writer. It's, <laughs> it's really admirable. And I'm just curious, you know, how you honed your craft. Like, how did you, how did you come to write this way? Well, gosh, I mean, it's, it's very humbling, um, to hear that praise from you. And it's, it hits really close to my heart because I care so much about, um, writing being beautiful and evocative and lyrical and, uh, 
you know, that really matters to me. It matters so much that in my book proposal, there was like a whole paragraph that was like, I'm writing about, you know, state violence and chattel slavery and all of this stuff. And it's nonfiction, but I really wanted it to be lyrical and uh, poetic, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So thank you for saying that. Um, I guess in a way I sort of resist answering the question because I feel like, I don't know. I'm still honing my craft, right? Like it's my, this is my first book. I'm a debut author. Um, but that being said, you know, I've been writing since I was really little, you know, like, I don't know, fifth grade or something. I think we had one of those word processors that like printed the paper with the perforated edges that you had to rip the the things off each side. It's really, really going to date me. Um, but I've been writing forever because I just have a wild imagination and I'm really self-reflective and I have a visual mind and I just like to, to think in terms of storytelling. Um, I probably, you know, turned to writing more about myself, like much more recently, you know, like in the, in the past five or 10 years is when I started writing more essays about myself, a huge piece of that for me. I mean, literally when you talk about like, how did you hone your craft? Oddly enough, a huge piece of it for me had to do with, um, deciding I was no longer going to diet and no longer going to, um, treat my body as something that should be fixed or erased or shrunk or controlled or, you know, take your pick of verbs there. I started my first diet when I was about four years old, like somewhere in there. I was a chubby kid and um, my mom, you know, driven both by the anti fat bias and those norms in her family and her concern for what my life might be like, you know, if I was fat, um, basically put me on a diet and I I dieted off and on for like 35 years, um, following that first one. The reason I think that it actually helps me write to stop dieting is because, um, well, for two reasons, one, of course it frees up a tremendous amount of energy, right? there's this whole section of your brain that you get to start using that has previously been devoted to like how many calories are in the handful of almonds that you're eating and all of the shame and all of the, you know, worry that went along with how I tried to control my body. So I just had more real estate in my brain. Um, But the other thing I think that happened was that I began to feel more at home in myself and more at home with the reality of who I am, which is someone who's fat. And those things were really creatively generative for this book in particular. So much of it is about my body, like the body kind of, I don't know, it ties the essays together and it kind of flows through each of the essays in its own way. Um, my body really, but I think that could not have been true if I was still deeply engaged in the project of dieting. It's like, if you're renovating a house, you can't hang out in it, right? Like when it's constantly under renovation, you can't stay there. You have to stay somewhere else. If you stop renovating it, then you can just hang out. And it was very much like that with me and my body. Like once I gave up or began to give, give up. Cause it's an ongoing process. That quest, um, I was able to just like sit in who I am and like my creativity, I don't know, it just went to the next level. So, um, that's one plug for not dieting. It might make you a better writer. Um, and then, you know, like all the usual stuff, I read a lot. Um, I write a lot and, uh, a lot of what I write is crap, but it's like, you know, you still do it. And with this book, I really learned how to be edited and the value of being edited. And so, you know, it would be totally wrong to suggest that like honing my craft or one's craft is like a unilateral project, like the willingness to have someone else come in and make astute observations and push you, um, is really important. And it wasn't super intuitive to me. Like I resisted it at times, but, Um, I had a friend explain to me that like the difference between being an amateur and a professional is like your willingness to take criticism and, you know, keep going. 
Um, and so, yeah, having a really good editor is also a powerful part of honing, you know, and, and in my case, it was tied to a book deal, but like an editor could just be your cousin who's an astute reader, you know, it just could be anybody who's going to pay attention to your work and uh, can be in conversation with you about it. Yeah, that feedback is so important. I mean, yeah, I will say I read some of these essays in their sort of genesis form when they were on your blog. And I think they were amazing then. But you know, you've you've expanded them and fleshed them out so much. And I think probably that collaborative process had something to do with that, right? Yes, 100%. I was really lucky to work with Don Davis, who's a powerhouse editor. And she was incredibly good at like she just has a radar for like where the weak spots are. She every everything she underlined was something that I kind of in the back of my mind knew like this isn't as strong as it can be. So I was really lucky. But um, you know, any 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 reader can improve your writing by giving you feedback. Totally. And yeah, no, having that sort of intuition of thinking, okay, this part maybe isn't as strong as it could be. And we resist that, right? As writers, we don't want to don't want to let ourselves see that but readers can help shine a light on it. It's true. And I was writing so much about myself and like such personal vulnerable things. I probably at times was just too close to the material, you know? Um, and so I would be like, no, I want to leave that in or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and ultimately occasionally I was right, but generally my editor was right. I so want to ask you more about like the vulnerability of this mm -hmm. and, you know, we're, we're getting close to the Q and a time though. So maybe we have about another minute or two. So in a, in a, you know, quick form, would you be able to share a little bit about sort of like what it was like? Cause I mean, f if I had written some of the essays in this book, I think I would feel a vulnerability hangover. You know, I think it's amazing and so powerful what you shared. And I'm so grateful that you shared it with readers in the world and right. There might be a toll or I don't know, it, it, you know, was there, do you think, do you feel like there was a certain sense of, you know, too much vulnerability or needing to process that, uh, afterwards? You know, as you know, Christy, cause you've written a book and now you're writing another one, it's a long process. So, you know, you have like two or three years with the material before it is public and so I, th I think I did a lot of the kind of prep around vulnerability um, just through the process. You know, I had readers um, who were not part of my book team. You know, I had my editor also. I had my agent. There were people who were reading the work. And so I got to have like a little taste of what it felt like to take this really personal thing and give it to someone else. Um but, you know, it's funny because people, people always say how vulnerable my writing is. And sometimes people have said like, it's brave or courageous. And that always scares me a little bit. Cause I, I imagine like if I were like getting dressed to go to the Oscars or something, and I came out to like reveal my gown and all my friends were like, wow, you're really brave. <laughs> like That's a really courageous, vulnerable outfit, you know? <laughs> Like, you'd be like, I'm not wearing this. Um, but it's, it's the only way that I really know how to write about myself. It's, it's just the only way I know how to be truthful. It's just the only way I know how to do it. And so there's a way that I don't really have a choice. Um, but the other thing I will say is like, there, there, are, there are things in there. Um, how do I say this? There are parts of my story that are not in the book even though they could have been, you know, there's a detail about my birth or I write about sexual assault, you know, and there's aspects of that that I'm not fully candid about and fully revealing about in the book. And that's because I really listened to my inter internal radar, you know, about what was too much. Um, and, and, you know, maybe that, knowing that I have that radar radar and I know how to listen to it probably enabled me to trust the vulnerability that is on the page because I, I didn't go farther than my own boundaries and nobody asked me to either. Um, very late in the process, there were a couple like sentences that I pulled out because I was like, I just don't think I want the whole world to know this. And my book team was like, of course it's your book, you know? 
Um, so having support around vulnerability and the limits of vulnerability, I think made me feel more confident about it too. Yeah, that's brilliant. I feel like those boundaries are so essential for being able to have vulnerability that doesn't overwhelm you entirely. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, now we'll move into the audience Q&A portion. We got a lot of good questions actually coming in on the chat. So, Oh, that's great. I can't see that. Yeah. This, are there people? Yeah, here? it's all happening behind the scenes. <laughs> Nicole is helping. Uh, okay. I only see me. us and I'm like, oh, there's nobody here, but whatever. I'm going to see my best. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I feel like it, yeah, helps keep it uh, conversational. But no, there's some there's some great folks uh, watching. And cool. someone, the first question actually sort of relates back to your um, speaking earlier about giving up dieting. Mm. The person writes, uh, Savala, you've mentioned your larger body a few times. Were you shocked when you learned how much of fat phobia is rooted in race? I'm a big fan of Christie's book, Anti-Diet, and had no idea before I read it. Well, thank mm -hmm. you I'm a big fan of Christie's book too. Um, was I shocked? I mean, I, I was shocked that I hadn't realized it sooner. <laughs> I guess let's put it that way. Um, you know, it is true that fat phobia is inextricably linked in our culture anyway, to anti-black racism and to chattel slavery. And um, I mean, I could spend the next 15 minutes talking about that, but I won't, but there's so much there's so much to read about that for people who are curious. Um, as I began to be educated about it, it just was like that very clear bell of truth rang in my head. And I guess it's what you call an epiphany, you know, or like a moment of clarity. I do remember realizing that a lot of my desire to not be fat was actually a desire to not be a fat black woman because especially when I was growing up of, of the erasure and the violence and the degradation that our culture throws onto fat black women. Um, and once I realized that like, oh, some of this is internalized anti-blackness, that gave me like a political hook um, that made my efforts more powerful. Like prior to that, I was still committed to, to freeing myself as much as I could from the culture of dieting, but it was very personal, you know, um, which is powerful, but it's only like one, it's only one hook getting the anti-blackness angle gave me like another hook. So, you know, so I could pull from, from both ends kind of to root this thing out of myself. So, you know, I don't know if it was shocking, but it was profound. It was really profound. Yeah, I think that's really powerful to have that additional sort of social justice reason to. Yeah, you're going right. to need it. <laughs> yeah. All the reasons you can get, you're going to need them. <laughs> right, exactly. You got to build that bulwark against diet culture. Yeah. Another question that came in is um, the person writes, you said someone older gave you the advice, don't let it get you down. Would you give the same advice to Gen Z? How have things changed in the social justice space since your own childhood? Mm. You know, I would give the same advice to someone who is younger, but in a, I mean, I am in my book, right? I hope people in Gen Z read my book, but like being incredibly clear that I'm not saying ignore the hardship or pretend there's no pain or um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps or put on a happy face. Like that is not at all how I mean it or would mean it, you know, speaking directly to younger people, um, which, you know, includes the people I teach, like the students I work with at UC Berkeley. Um, I would, I would, and am, you know, very clear and hope to be very clear that the idea of not letting it get you down is fundamentally about, fundamentally about retaining your humanity as a person that the world wants to destroy, right? It's not about ignoring, uh, ignoring the efforts to destroy you. It's about 
being very clear and very firm internally in your own humanity um, as those assaults happen and using your own very clear belief in your humanity as a way to, you know, not spend your life on your knees. Like, I mean it in a very rigorous way, not um, in a lighthearted way. So yeah, that's advice that I would give anybody, you know, I will, I will no, no doubt give it to my daughter when she's older. It's really powerful. And I appreciate that distinction too, of, of thinking of it, not as something glib or just like brushing it away, but actually to help endure and, um, cope with what the world throws at you with a very clear understanding of what that is. Right. Yeah. Another question that came in is for many people who straddle these disparate identities, they feel as though they never fully belong to any one group, neither nor more so than both. And what is your advice for finding that feeling of belonging? Okay. These questions are so good. Like, did they all come from my publisher? (laughs) (laughs) Did they plant questions in this audience? (laughs) Great, great question. Um, I mean, we live in a world that likes binaries, right? We, we like things to be clear. We like things to be segregated. And I mean, the we that I'm describing here is like the culture, right? Um, we like to know where we are in the hierarchy so that we know we're above someone else. Right. And we don't, um, readily embrace things that complicate that and that, draw our attention to the arbitrary nature of the lines we draw. Um, it's like too destabilizing, you know, to have things that are liminal and interstitial proliferate in the culture because it messes up the boundaries. It messes up the sort of tidy hierarchy. Don't get me started on capitalism. I could go there, but I won't. I'll just drop a pin there for someone to like meditate on. Um, So I feel this person's like angst, you know, around being in between, being neither nor, being both and, you know, I certainly feel it in my life. You know, it's just like a string of simultaneous polarities in every aspect of my identity pretty much. Um, And I think when I was younger, you know, maybe like this person who asked the question, it made me uncomfortable. Like I longed for a seamless and easy sense of belonging, like anywhere that would have me. Um, I longed to be kind of plucked out of my otherness, you know, by someone who I thought had the cultural power and cachet to do that. Um, I just don't feel that way anymore. I just don't feel that way anymore. And I attribute that to, you know, some of it is hopefully just like the natural maturing of like any human heart, you know, you, as you get older, you become more at ease with your position in the culture and with who you are to give, if I can say that. Um, but what I would encourage, you know, this person to do, if they're feeling too in between, um, is to seek out other people who are in between in the ways that you are and in different ways Um, because like there's comfort in numbers, right? For me, when I was in high school, I had the chance to be in a room of like a hundred other mixed race people. And it was so healing and beautiful. And like, granted, this was the mid nineties. Maybe that wouldn't be healing for people who are mixed teenagers now. I don't, I don't know, but um there is so much solace to be found among your fellow in-betweeners. Um, so I would seek that out, you know, whether it's in real life or Instagram or, you know, wherever you do your seeking. And then I think it's Dolly Parton who said, um, find what makes you different and then do it on purpose. And I love that. And I would offer that same advice um, to a younger person, you know, as for whether things have changed from, from when I was going through this as a young person to now, I don't really know. I mean, I'm, 
I'm, I'm very optimistic about the genius and the heart and the grit of marginalized people. I'm less optimistic about the system's ability to fully reform itself, like, especially in the span of a generation. Um, so I don't know whether things are different, meaning improved, but you know, I am always optimistic and have deep faith in the people who are marginalized by the culture and their ability um, to carry on. So I think that part of it abides for me. My faith in people who are marginalized abides. Yeah, that's beautiful. Very well said. Um, the last question we have, well, the last audience question we have time for is how do you describe the body's role in our lives? Is it a habitat, <laughs> habitat or an armor, or perhaps it is us? This is such a profound question, actually. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that is another good one. Um, well, golly, I mean, here's what I can say, you know, our bodies are where we experience all of the divides, right? All of the stratification, all of the hierarchy, you know, around race, around gender, around class, like it's through our body and on our body that we actually experience those things that they're not just intellectual, but that we have an encounter with them and an ongoing series of encounters, right? Across our lifespan. Um, this to me makes the body the site of so much knowledge and epiphany and humor and truth and lies too. <laughs> like, it's, you know, it's not all great. I've certainly believed lies about my body. Probably everyone has. And so I think of the body as um, being a couple things, you know, it's the place where the political and the personal and the historical are in constant collision, right? It's like this dynamic site where sparks are always flying as those things collide. And it's a really rich source, I think, of insight about um, what it means to be a human being and the friction and the joy that that involves. So I think of the body as um, certainly more than just a habitat, but you know, yes, a habitat, but certainly more than that. I mean, I, I hesitate to call it a resource because that sounds like something that we're supposed to like use or we're entitled to use. And that's not how I mean it, but um, maybe the body is like a fountain, you know, <laughs> that we, we both are and are in. Um, yeah. Does that kind of get, a, does that kind of respond to the question a little bit? Totally. I and I think I'm still thinking I, about the question is so interesting. It's such a good question. I feel like I'll be pondering it for a while, but I love the idea of a fountain because it's kind of like a source and it's something that yeah, yeah we're, we're in, but we're also maybe drawing from like, mm -hmm. you know, that's, it's fascinating. Really, really an interesting question. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone so much for all your questions. These were amazing. And I wish we had time for a whole another hour of this, but Me too. before we officially wrap though, it's a tradition uh, at Inforum to ask all our speakers the following question, which I will ask you now, Savala. Okay. That is, I'm ready. <laughs> all right. This is a good one too. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Okay. Well, this is, for me, this was a no brainer, hard question, but it was a no brainer. And Christy, I know you're going to like it. Um, I'm speaking to everybody when I say this, but I'm especially speaking to women identified people because I do think that we are, um, often like really slammed around dieting and diet culture and the project of perfecting our bodies, changing our bodies, making our bodies sexually alluring to whatever the culture decides is sexually alluring. Uh, the beauty industry, you know, all of that. I think the hammer comes down really hard on, on women identified folks. So my brief, but hopefully profound idea is that people stop dieting, especially women identified people. 
And I define a diet as a way of eating or moving that um, you would lose interest in if you knew that it was either not going to lead to weight loss or that it might lead to weight gain. And that's kind of a spin on how Virgie Tovar, who's an activist and a scholar in this space, defines dieting. Christy, you probably have a great, a great definition of it too, but like if you're engaged in those activities, stop, like you gotta stop. Um, there's a great quote by Naomi Wolf where she says, I'm going to, I'm going to get it wrong. But the idea is that a culture, uh, fixated on female thinness is not obsessed with female beauty. It's obsessed with female obedience, right? Because dieting and this endless goal of perfecting, shrinking, changing the body, um, ultimately is like a political sedative and a political distraction. There's another great quote by Sander Gilman, who's a scholar that I'm also going to butcher, but like Google it, it'll come up that, uh, says dieting is a way that women demonstrate that they understand their role and their place in the culture. Like let that sink in, right? Barf. These two scholars, you know, they use very binary language, but I mean, women are women identified in the most expansive way possible. So, and then I think what Sonia Renee Taylor, who's another activist and scholar in this sphere says, you know, these are her words, I believe that if, if white women put the same energy into dismantling racism that they put into dieting, like problem solved. So not my words, but you guys get the gist. And, uh, yeah, like look into how to free yourself from that process and devote all that time, energy, money into something more liberatory for yourself or for other human beings. Mm, So good. I love that 60 second change the world answer. And that would be mine too. I think if I had to give one, so I know, I feel like maybe I stole yours for when you were <laughs> doing a Commonwealth club, Christy, but you know, you can, we can recycle these things, right? Totally. Yeah. I'll, uh, Concepts. I'll nod back to you. Yeah. And it's like, right. So many activists for generations, you know, a couple generations before us at least have been talking about these things going back to, you know, the fat underground in the seventies and, yep. you know, this is, this is really liberating, you know, liberatory stuff. And yet it's something that doesn't get discussed enough, I think, in progressive spaces or among people who are committed to other forms of social justice. So I really appreciate you highlighting it. Hey, my pleasure. And as you know, you know, you were one of my early teachers in this process of divesting from diet culture and coming home to my own body. Um, so thank you for, mm. you know, enabling me to give that answer. Right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably have that insight, but for your work and your podcast, especially. Thank you so much. That means a lot. I like, I love seeing how people who free themselves from diet culture go on to do amazing things in the world. And yeah, like, it's transformative. Oh, it's so brilliant. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. This was wonderful. And thank you everyone so much for being with us tonight at Inform at the Commonwealth Club. Just want to remind our audience that copies of Savala's new book, Don't Let It Get You Down, are available now for purchase, including at Marcus Books, which is uh, Commonwealth Club's local partner in Oakland. And this program is part of the Good Lit series underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org online. I'm Christy Harrison. Thank you all so much and take care. 